Okay, welcome to the Nefesh Benefesh Zionist Education Initiative weekly podcast, the Zionist Dream. And we are going to be talking about um, Rav Saul Vashik's uh, essay, Kol Dudido Fake, and his six knocks. Okay, very, very exciting times uh, as we as we get into this idea. It's actually an essay, just, just by way of introduction, an essay that was originally a speech that was given in the 50s, um, written up and now translated in multiple languages. Easy, easy to get, highly from uh, the Zionist Education Department. We highly recommend reading reading through Rav Salvechik's writings. And uh, today we're going to have the opportunity to really break into understand their six of these knocks, understand them in, in their context and how they apply today. So what's what's fascinating about this, and again, the whole idea of our of our podcast is to make sure that people think about Zionist issues. And what's fascinating about our solve issues, uh, there's a couple of fascinating things. First of all, it was written in 1956, so only eight years after the uh, after the foundation of the state of Israel. So to put it into context of uh, of time and and what was happening at the at this point in history. This isn't Rosovich writing in uh, you know 2022, uh, where you know the state is fully developed. Um, the state at this point in time was going through hardships. Um, it had just lost one uh, percent of its people uh, in the first uh, independence war just seven years before. Um, it had, the people had gone through a Holocaust a mere a mere uh, ten years before, and the and the the Arab population, the Jews that came from Arab lands, had were arrived um, just a mere five years before this, 850,000 of them, which had almost sunk the country economically. So that's the that's where Rosovich is writing. Um, Rosovich also, it's important to recognize himself, where he's coming from. Rosovich is, is from a family of an anti-Zionist family. And their family is almost, I would consider it, almost like royalty in terms of the of Torah scholar families. Uh, and what I mean by that is, the family works as one unit, the Salvation family. Whatever the family maintains, that's what it maintains. And um, you had to be anti-Zionist to be in this family. That was basically how it worked. But Salvation was the first Salvation to break free from the Salvation family and become and join what was called the Mizrahi movement, still the Mizrahi movement, um, and break off of the Aguda, anti-Zionist Aguda, which brought him the ostracization of not only from his family, but of the world of Torah, the Torah world that he was a part of, um, essentially ostracized him for this. He had to create his own Torah community um, at Yeshiva University um, and, and within the Zionist Mizrahi world in order to uh, to be able to have a community that he could that he could function in, but the for the large part, for the most part, the Torah world looked at him. They, they derided him. They called him JB um, for this uh, for for this position instead of, because of Joseph Bear was his name in English. Um, they wouldn't even call him Yashav Bear, which would have been an insult in the first place. So Rosovich's position here is is groundbreaking. Now, what was so groundbreaking about his position? was the fact that Rav Salvation looks at the foundation of the state of Israel. Now, this is going to, in our post, um, you know, Rav Kook, Hasidish world, this almost seems like uh, obvious. But you have to keep in mind where the Salvation and Bris comes from. Not every single thing that happens in the world is a miracle, right? That's not that's not how it works. Not everything is a miracle. Um, and what they did was they uh, they essentially said, okay, what Rav Salvation said was, the foundation of the state of Israel was miraculous. This was divine providence, um, as opposed to just saying this is the way of the world, which is how the rest of the Salvation and and uh, and most of the Torah world was looking at the foundation of Israel. They didn't see it in theological terms. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, that's very that's very strange because today almost all religious Zionists think of this as uh, the state of Israel as the beginning of the Gula of the redemption. That was not a popular opinion back then. That's not even an opinion there. So Avicii took, but he did see the foundation of the state as a uh, as you know um, as a, a div- an act of divine providence. So I'm sorry for going on and on. But it's important uh, to put that great great right, introduction to put this into context as to what was going on. Okay, go ahead. I hear a great story. Yeah. Okay, so there's a story that's been going around uh, going around this week. Uh, so Rav Schefter, Virtual Schefter, is a big Talmud, a big student of, of Rav, Rav Soloveitchik. And he, uh, when in his youth, he spent, he spent some time in BMG, in the Lakewood Yeshiva. So he was he was very much taken aback that, uh, that in, the Lakewood, in, in Lakewood, they uh, they referred to Rav Soloveitchik as JB. And he found it very disrespectful, so he referred to their their rosh yeshiva as AK Rav Aaron, Rav Aaron Cutler, so which resulted in him getting kicked out of the yeshiva. Great, so, like, uh, probably deserving, but anyway, <laughs> right. Right. Um, uh, but yeah. uh, seeing the the different the different worlds in which in which they operate, certainly not all Jews, uh, not all 
scholarly communities that think the same. Right. So uh, this yeah. this is definitely revolutionary in a lot of ways. Okay. So okay. So going back to this, you can story. <laughs> uh, so going back to this uh, this idea here. The uh, so so had uh, you know took a pasuk and shir shir, a verse in the Song of Songs, and uh, that talks about a lover um, coming to his lover's tent and knocking on the door. And uh, and waiting for her to come out of bed and to come greet him, and and she doesn't. She sits in the in her bed and does not uh does not come out of her bed to uh to greet him. Um, and so he knocks again. By the time she gets out of bed, um, she comes to the door. The lover is gone. Um, cold old fake. My lover is knocking on the door. That's what the words mean in Hebrew from that pasuk, and that's what Rosalvechik um, named the essay. The idea being that. God was knocking on the door of the Jewish people um, with the creation of the state of Israel. And that's the idea. And whether or not, um, as he's spe speaking um, you know, exclusively to American Jewry, but will American Jewry answer the knock? Um, and to his point in 1956, they had not. Okay, so he talks about six different knocks. So let's go through the uh, the six different knocks together. Yeah, Rabbi, why don't you start us off? You're already you're on a roll. Oh, like, yeah, this is right. this is definitely. A I like this. So there, this uh, is a good essay. This is a it's an interesting essay. Um, then, so his first, Rosalvich's first stop is that he says that you can see that this was divine providence, the foundation of the state of Israel, was divine providence, because the the Soviet Union and the United States again, these are two entities that we have trouble relating to today. But these were the worst of enemies, the worst of rivals, uh, competition like you can't imagine, and they had both agreed to support. The, the state of the founding of the state of Israel. It's unheard, it was unheard of, unheard of for the two of them to support the same position. So for them to go ahead and support the same position was, you know, that, that can only come about because of divine providence. So that Rosal saw was, uh, was an, a complete act of divine providence. Right. Also, it's, uh, I don't, I don't know if we can appreciate it today. Like, I don't know if we can, you know, given, given the time period of the 1950s and yet we, we speak of it with such relevance that we uh we quote the six knocks here uh, quite frequently, but to think of two two rival superpowers, which we don't even know, like you know, some people say the United States, China, like uh in in some regards, but the the height of such tension to come to come together is such a realization, and I don't think uh I, that might be lost right. on on this generation in yeah. in that regard. Um, all right, so this uh, we'll we'll get into the second knock, and uh, this one is something we that's a little bit more relatable. Um, and it's it's the tzal, the IDF. The Rav was uh, was certainly mindful of of the tremendous victories that that the Israel Defense Forces had, um, and against the the mightiest armies imaginable. So well, keep in mind, it's 1956, so there's only one victory at this point. One victory. Okay, fine. Right. So, so, saying, so, so, but no, but that that's that, uh, my point is that that's an even bigger right, um, right. sign because for us to come along and say, okay, we've won nine wars. Right and say okay that's miraculous case that makes sense but for salvation it was enough for him to see one, one. Victory. right right I'm saying think about for us like uh if we, if we want to say is 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 God still knocking is are, are the knocks still relevant even more so how much more so at, the, right. at this point in time um the challenges that Israel that Israel has over overtaken and he says the tiny defense forces of Israel defeated the mighty Arab armies the miracle of the many delivered into the hands of the few I'll materialize before our eyes and that yeah. was and that's remarkable. Right. So, so he's being, taking that from Hanukkah, right? right that's the right. that's the one from Hanukkah, right? Now, the reason why he's taking it from Hanukkah, by the way, is because the Hanukkah was it's for for a Purim victory or for a Pesach victory. So there you had prophets; they were able to say, "Okay, this was God's hand. This wasn't coincidence." Hanukkah didn't have that aspect. There were no prophets at the time of Hanukkah. It was the Chacham's decision that, yeah, this was miraculous, which is strange because how would they know it's miraculous? So. It shows that there's what's what's called the das. There's a there's a way of of being able to calculate. Yeah, that's probably miraculous. Um, and that was that was, that wasn't you know so uh, so yeah so it's not such an easy thing to do as to say that something's miraculous. So so what you saying he's using this line to show that our military victories, just like the Hanukkah military victory, wasn't just our strength, but rather it was something else here. It was uh it was it was a, a miraculous victory by uh you know, by divine providence. Same thing here that we have uh with, with the IDF. Okay, so. fantastic. Well, what's the next knock? Okay, so the next knock is is also something very hard for us to recognize. In the nineteen in the early nineteen sixties, was something called the Reformation, where the Catholic Church went against um, and reversed most of its uh most of its early doctrine, which say which stated that. Um, the Christians were the ones that replaced the Jews as God's chosen people. God had had uh, had come down in a physical form as is, is Jesus, and the Jews had rejected Jesus, and therefore 
the Christians were the true um, chosen people now because they had, uh, yeah, and, and their proof to this was, look at the state of being that the Jews are in. Right? God says, I'm going to take care of the chosen people. Well, if you look at the time period for the 2,000 years we were in exile, so who is God taking care of? So it's very easy for Christians to say, um, look, you're obviously, you know, you're not the, the chosen people anymore. We're the chosen people. Um, and now you come along and say, okay, now we have the state. Now we're clearly the uh, the chosen people. Okay. All right. So I, they I, refuted, refuted all Christian doctrine, all Catholic right. doctrine. Um, and now that, that's huge. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely huge. Right. Uh, for Jews to know that now, definitively, the Catholic Church is, uh, you know, their whole thesis of their of their religion was it was completely empty. Right. Um, I think there's there's just a just a pause before we get uh, it gets our next knock. The the globalization that Rav Soloveitchik um, applied in in his six knocks. One is certainly from a theological perspective. One's geopolitical perspective. We see the modern marvel that is the the IDF, right? Like the Russell Vision, like from from a military perspective. And uh, even as we get into the fourth one, that uh, the, the Rav discussed this idea of the state of Israel um, bringing back assimilated youth. Right, that so many Jews throughout the world were were assimilating into into secular culture. Were be, considering themselves more a member of whatever country they belong to than to the Jewish people. And, and there was a tremendous sense of pride that Israel was allowed to reinstill that, that connection um, and bring, bring youth back. So even on a, on a philosophical level to think uh, on, and I'm not sure what, what the term is, but um, what we would say drawing people close in Kiru, the right. Kiru is uh, also a different level that the Rub is thinking about. Well, that's his fourth now. Right. right? Right, fourth, no, guess, well, that is its fourth. Right, 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 right. <laughs> the, the assimilated Jews now have, you know, they had no point to pride. Now, mm -hmm. what, what's their pride? So it's much easier to be a proud American, let's say, than it is to be a, a, you know, a proud Jew when there's nothing really to be proud of as a Jew except your religion, which right. nobody else can tell. And certainly so, 10 years after the Holocaust. Right, right. So so now the state of Israel gives you that. Well, then it was two or three years after, after the Holocaust. Then now the state of Israel right, comes right. along. And assimilated Jews can say, "Hey, those are that's those are my guys. That's my country. That's my team. I'm on that team," and brings them back. Okay, the last, uh, the fifth knock, sorry, is that uh, the enemies of the Jewish people now knew that Jewish blood was no longer cheap. This is uh, this is something very important. Pogroms, Crusades, Holocaust. The message was always out there: Jewish blood is cheap. And now we see Jewish blood is most definitely not cheap. Right, and uh, le leading us on a, on the most perhaps the most practical level. That was certainly relevant then in a couple of just years after the Holocaust, but also now is that uh, the ability for Jews to finally have a, a safe haven, a refuge in the world where they can say, this is mine and nobody else is in control. Um, and and it's come, it's not a, not a theoretical, it's certainly practical in that hundreds of thousands of Jews, millions of Jews have, have made Israel their home. Um, this year. This, right, right, this year. Right, 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 right. Right. And Russians as well. Right, all right, all right. So yeah, so I just said that those are the six knocks. Now I want to say something a little controversial here, uh, because I think it's important to bring up. A lot of people would say, you know what, don't offend people, skip this. Um, you know, and, and the truth is, in my column that I wrote about this, I did skip it because I, uh, people found it a little too offensive to to put in. But I think if we're going to talk about Rosovich and six knocks and and skip this part, I think it's 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 it, you know flat, it's dishonest. Yeah, you might as well not talk about it if you're going to skip this because you're afraid of uh, offending people. Um, but uh, but the Rosovich ends his six knocks by saying to American Jewry, God has been knocking for eight years and we've been ignoring the knock. Right. For the most part, American Jewry did not answer the call to move to Israel. Right. So uh, so and and you know, there hasn't been even a million American Jews that moved to Israel. Right. So so that is a that's that's a failure of hearing the knock. And Rosovich says to the American community in 1956, he says this. Um, he says, you're, you're failing, you're missing the knocks, you're missing the lesson of, of Kobe, Kobe, the effect. How can you go ahead and do this? How can you, how can you, uh, how can you miss the knocks? And he challenges the American Jewish community and blames the American Jewish community. This is something that we're, we don't do at Nefesh Nefesh. It's not something that we're, that, you know, that we, that we want to do. But at the same time, if you do buy into this idea that there is divine providence in the creation of the state of Israel, right? And you don't have to buy into that idea. You could just say that this is a wonderful thing that happened, um, but doesn't necessarily mean it's divine in nature and that God interrupted the course of events and that it's miraculous. You don't you don't have to say that. But if you are going to say that and you are going to be a believer in Kaldi Dilofek, so then it behooves you to move to Israel because 
you were sitting there lying in bed while your lover is knocking on the door. God is knocking on the door saying, hey, I got you, Israel. What are you still doing here? Uh, so I think that leads us to ask the question of, is, is, is it too late? Did God already leave, right? And, or can you look at this and say, no, um, God is continuously knocking. It's right. been a it's been a seventy four year knock, and God doesn't God doesn't it doesn't leave. You know, during COVID, I think right. a lot of people got scared that maybe I won't be able. Not because Israel closed its doors to tourists, because we got because Israel could always keep the doors open to to people making aliyah. The doors were open. It's a little more difficult to come here, but but that lends to the point that. There could be a time where Israel says everybody's welcome, but it's impossible to get here. If airlines won't fly here, so then you're not getting into Israel, right? So, so that becomes a, a scary part. And that's when I think you'd have a situation where you say, I missed the knock. Um, so it's, it's I, I think it gets up to everybody that's listening to ask themselves, okay, have we have we missed the knock or have we not missed the knock? It's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's harsh. You know, it is harsh. And Rosovich was harsh. And again, yeah. you can, you can have reject Rosovich. You have every right to say that. I don't believe that the creation of the state of Israel was an act of, of divine providence. And that's a perfectly legitimate, uh, you know, viewpoint to take. No one has to agree with Rosovich. But if you do agree with Rosovich and you do think that it was a divine knock, then, uh, yeah, then yeah, right. Why aren't, why aren't you in Israel? Uh, you're thinking that God is not. Okay. Um, next week, I think we're going to do our next episode is on Zionism and power. This is a fascinating question of do uh, yeah do, does does is there a problem with the Jewish people exercising power over non Jews? A lot of people have an issue with that, and uh, is that really consistent with the Zionist viewpoints? Fantastic. Okay. I'll see you next week.